some supplements are just a complete waste of money that are overhyped. And if you're overweight, there's a few that you really should watch out for because they're just gonna waste your time and waste your money more than anything else. So let's go ahead and dive in. And after this video, I put a link down below for probably one of the coolest things I've seen in the biohacking world yet, let alone used, and it is a red light therapy blanket. So you can't make fun of me for red light therapy anymore because the science is way too strong and it definitely works and the military uses it, professional athletes use it, sports teams use it, definitely works. The problem is you really need like full body coverage. So a lot of times people end up having to go to like really expensive tanning beds, sort of things that are actually red light therapy beds. And anyway, the point is, is that Bond Charge has a red light therapy like blanket. It's like a sleeping bag that you get in where they've managed to get the 660 nanometer wavelength red light into a flexible sort of diode that you can actually crawl in this thing like a sleeping bag. And it's very reasonably priced when you consider how much it costs to typically go in a red light therapy bed. Plus that link down below gets you 25% off. So make sure you use that code that is down there by the link for Bond Charge for 25% off any of their products, but specifically in this case, their red light therapy blanket, which is more like a sleeping Bag. Okay, first supplement on the chopping block is Forskolin. Now this is an interesting one because some people really seem to think this stuff works. Okay, and if you look at the data at first, if you don't know how to read a paper, it seems interesting because in in vitro research, it seems to increase hormone sensitive lipase. Hormone sensitive lipase is like a pair of scissors. Okay, it snips off fatty acids off of a glycerol backbone. Hormone sensitive lipase is amazing. It does help us liberate fat, which is tremendous for fat loss, right? It's critical for lipolysis. So in vitro, when you see that forskolin increases hormone sensitive lipase, you're thinking like, oh my gosh, this is gonna liberate so much fat. Well, if you look at the literature, there's a study published in Nutrients that actually showed promising data, but we have to look at it more. So what this study did is it took a look at subjects that had 250 milligrams of forskolin or a placebo for 30 days, along with a deficit and exercise. And if you look at the literature that's trying to promote Forskolin, they'll say, hey, the Forskolin group lost weight. Both groups lost the same amount of weight. And then there's a study that was published in Nutrients that took a look at 715 people that took Forskolin. And they found that out of those 715 people, 10.5% as a huge chunk developed adverse events. 91% of those adverse events were GI issues. About 80% of those GI issues were diarrhea and it was dose dependent. The more that people took, the more likely they would have diarrhea. So yeah, you're gonna lose weight. Congratulations, you're gonna have diarrhea. It's just one more thing to take. It's just flat out not worth it. Now this next one could be interesting could be misconstrued the wrong way because I've done videos talking about the benefits of this from a different perspective. But the fact that chromium picolinate is being marketed as a weight loss compound now is really mind boggling. If your goal is to lose weight, chromium's not for you. Chromium has a benefit to helping GLUT4 translocation and potentially the expression of GLUT4, which may help control postprandial glucose a little bit, which could indirectly control weight loss, don't get me wrong, it could control your weight more. But what we're looking at with the weight loss studies, it's pretty weak. If you look at a study published in the Cochrane Database of Systematic Reviews, they looked at nine different studies, ranging from 200 micrograms of chromium up to 400 micrograms of chromium per day. And they saw that there was on paper, what looked like a decent impact from chromium in terms of weight loss. So it was like a little bit favorable, but it was clinically debatable. What that means is like when you actually look at the data, none of this was adjusted for confounders. They didn't look at any other variables. So there was caffeine in some, there was exercise in some, because there's a meta-analysis where they look at doing a systematic review, right? The bottom line was that it was very widely spread. Like we don't know what the actual conditions were, and it was such a barely favorable response to chromium, you could get such a better effect from having caffeine or something like that. And then you look at a study published in Obesity Reviews, again, it was 11 studies they looked at, and they found on average between like eight to 26 weeks, there was about a 0.5 kilogram weight loss when chromium was added in. So does that mean that it's tremendous for weight loss? No, that's not a lot of weight. But what that implies, since none of the settings were controlled and we don't really know much data, is that it probably had a minorly measurable impact on glucose, which in some metabolically unhealthy people may have made it easier for them to lose weight. So my suggestion with chromium is not to throw it in the trash. It's relatively inexpensive. I suggest people take chromium with a meal that has higher carbohydrates and monitor your glucose with it and see if it actually helps. 
But more importantly, it's an element, a mineral that we do need. So if you're not getting foods that have chromium in it, yeah, supplement chromium. It's not a bad supplement, but taking it for weight loss is just worthless. This next one is probably the biggest culprit because there are a lot of marketing scams out there that talk about bitter orange or synephrine, the extract of bitter orange, as a potent metabolic like ramp up, like it's gonna drive up your metabolism, increase your metabolic rate. The International Journal of Medical Sciences had published a paper looking at 20 different studies, so another meta-analysis, and they found that all of these studies were showing huge promising effects with bitter orange and synephrine, the extract of bitter orange, on increasing metabolic rate, like measurable increases in resting metabolic rate. Well, what more could we ask for? That's exactly what we want. We want to increase our metabolic rate. But there was a huge, huge, huge glaring issue with this. Every single study that showed favorable results with bitter orange or synephrine, guess what? They also had caffeine in them. Because a lot of times when you take a bitter orange supplement, they also add caffeine or green tea extract or some form of caffeine. Guess what? In these papers, all the way up to 528 milligrams of caffeine. You know how much caffeine's in a cup of coffee, right? Like we're talking 80 to 120. So, you know, just, just a modest five cups of coffee, that's not gonna do anything to your metabolic rate, right? When you look at the nine studies out of these studies that did not have caffeine, that only had bitter orange, guess what? Only one showed a pathetically small increase in resting metabolic rate. The other eight did not. I rest my case, I'm pretty sure it's the caffeine that's doing the job here. Another one that I wanna make a mention of, carnitine. Carnitine is an interesting thing because carnitine is absolutely critical for fat metabolism. Carnitine is what helps fat transfer into the mitochondria, and yes, that is important. Taking carnitine without exercise is not going to do you any good. And when you look at some of the data compared to placebo without exercise, it really doesn't do much. It's not strong. But carnitine deficiencies are real. And when you train hard, you do become deficient in carnitine. So carnitine is one of those where if you're going to take it as a fat burner without exercise, it's not really worth it. It's not gonna do anything and it's inexpensive. But if you're going to exercise, then sure, it could have an impact. But what we're seeing in the literature is that anything above and beyond your baseline of where you should be is not going to be advantageous. But if you're training a lot, you're dipping below baseline a lot. So yeah, taking a little bit of carnitine surrounding your workout period when you would deplete it could help stimulate a little bit more fatty acid oxidation. But do not fall victim to taking carnitine multiple times throughout the day, especially without exercise. Okay, now I wanna flip this on its head for just a second, and I wanna twist it around and talk about one that is more important for fat loss that people suggest usually is not because they think they're gonna gain weight, and that's creatine one of the most researched supplements that is out there next to caffeine. And you might think, oh, I'm gonna gain weight with creatine. I wanna mention this as something that is cheap and effective that probably works better than these other four that I've talked about. It's an energy producing supplement. It's gonna help you create more or have more available creatine phosphate to immediately produce ATP when you need it on demand. So it's going to get you stronger, yes. It's potentially going to help you build muscle, yes. Potentially help you put on lean body mass, which revs up your metabolism, yes. But there's even some literature that suggests that it's going to improve recovery and improve inflammatory responses, inflammatory markers, to the point that it actually might drive up lean body mass and bring down body fat. So the literature on creatine is very, very, very strong, whereas the literature on things like bitter orange are a complete joke. So as always, keep it locked in here on my channel. I'll see you tomorrow.